Hey everybody, I'm Cabot Phillips with The Daily Wire. Along with our release of the new film, Run, Hide, Fight, we're talking today with John Matthews, who is the executive director of the Community Safety Institute, one of the nation's leading experts on mass shootings, and one of the advisors on the film, Run, Hide, Fight. John, thanks so much for talking with us today. Well, thank you for letting me be here. So you've been an expert in this field for three plus decades in law enforcement. How did you become an expert in mass shootings and school shootings specifically? Well, I've been in law enforcement for 38 years and um, I've worked with schools all over the nation. Uh, we've done thousands of assessments with school systems. Uh, I've developed the uh, one of the very first uh, national school safety programs for the Department of Justice back in the early 1990s. One of the subsections of school safety, unfortunately, is mass shootings. As we work with schools to harden the targets, to prepare to, to be proactive in school safety, we started looking at mass shootings. And everybody, you know, the standard things when you look at a mass shooting is, oh, the bad guy. What made him do it? What makes him tick? Well, in law enforcement, when you're responding to a shooting, you're not thinking about what made that bad guy do it. You're thinking about stopping the shooting and saving lives. You know, in law enforcement, that's one of the, the greatest pleasures, I guess, that I've had in my career is if you can save somebody's life. I mean, it's just a, a, a great feeling and, and you help somebody out. So we decided to look at mass shootings from a little bit different standpoint. What did these victims do in this situation, in the spur of the moment, right, that allowed them to survive? So the school work that I've done around the country kind of led into the mass shooting work that we've done, and we've trained law enforcement and educators all over the nation. So you served as technical advisor and associate producer on the film Run, Hide, Fight. Obviously a, a very uh, you know, sensitive subject to have an entire movie on. What was your take on, on how the movie portrayed school shootings and do you feel like they did so accurately? Well, when they first called me and said, hey, would you like to be an advisor on this film? I said, no, mm. I, I don't want to do it. I've worked with schools all over the country. I've been involved in mass shootings and I thought the topic was just you know, really sensitive and I wasn't sure I want to be involved. But then Kyle sent me the script and I read the script and I saw much more in the script than a school shooting. The script to me was the story of a young lady and her mother. It just so happened to take place in the school. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, I've, I've got six kids. Most of my children have grown up in this school shooting environment, unfortunately. You go ask any of my kids, what does lockdown mean? They're gonna tell you. It's a shame that you ask a six-year-old, what did you do today? And they come home and say, oh, we did our lockdown drill. Yeah. But it's a necessary part of our society. And we've gotta be prepared and we've gotta plan and we've gotta know how to implement you know, these various drills. And I think the, the film kind of uh, demonstrates in a number of different ways the escape model that we came up with to survive a mass shooting safely. Yeah. I think it puts the reality of the violence of, of school incidents right out in front where everybody can see it. A lot of times we don't want to see it, right? Yeah. And if we watch the news and we see that there's a school shooting and it's too violent for us, we turn it off instead of really looking and taking time to say, what do we need to do from a pragmatic standpoint to make our schools safer? So for people who haven't seen the film, I don't wanna give a spoiler alert yet, although it is in the trailer, there is a scene with a female staff member in the cafeteria who pulls out her phone and she calls her husband. And there were some people in the comment section saying, well, why didn't she call 911? And people might've been thinking that. What was your take on that scene and, and kind of your expertise? Is that something that would happen in a real life situation? That's reality. We want to think we'd call 911, right? That's yeah. what we've been trained to do and everything. But that's not what research tells us. When we look at what victims actually do, um, they're traumatized, they pick up their phone. The first call they make is their spouse or significant other. Well, then you want to say, well, of course, 911 is the second call, right? No, it's not. They call their boss. It's not till the third phone call you make that you call 911. And so that scene was actually very, very realistic. That cafeteria worker was trying to relay to, I think it was her husband, yeah. I'm okay and I'm gonna be okay. What are some things people might see in the movie and think, well, that's not realistic, but in your research actually is. There's been so many things we found in assessments around the country. I was actually doing an assessment in a school. They had a fire while we were doing the assessment, a real fire. Mm. And no one called the fire department. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? 
And I was told that the teachers had to get permission. They had to call the principal, confirm it was a fire before they could call the fire department mm. because they didn't want to look bad. In run, hide, fight in the front office, um, you look at it and go, why aren't they calling 911? Well, remember after Parkland, the school shooting in Parkland, when he pulled the fire alarm? Yeah. Schools, some of them implemented a policy to say, well, we don't want this to happen again. So if the fire alarm is pulled, we have to confirm there's a fire or an incident before we call a lockdown. One of the other interesting things Kyle and I talked about was uh, there's one scene where the shooter, somebody asked the shooter, how did you know this? How did you know the school policy? He said, because the school board had a vote on it and it was an open public record, easy to research. He knew exactly what the school was gonna do and how they were gonna do it. And unfortunately, that's something we see in our assessments around the country. So at one point when the initial carnage starts taking place in the cafeteria, I found myself as a viewer saying, where are the teachers? Why, why are there no adults in the room right now calling 911 or ushering students out? Is that something in your research that you saw where there could be places where students were congregating where there weren't any administrators or teachers around? Well, certainly, and as we go to schools around the country, you not only have cafeterias or cafetoriums, a lot of times you have outdoor dining spaces for them, garden areas, things like that. So there are many times in schools that you have students with absolutely no teachers. Now, if we talk about an elementary school, there's a handoff. The teacher will walk mm -hmm. the young children down, the cafeteria workers will meet them, the children will sit eat in the cafeteria. When we're talking about junior high or high school those teachers uh, God love them they want their break they want to get to their break the students go down to the cafeteria the teachers go to the teachers lounge and so there's many many times we're in a cafeteria doing an assessment and there are no adults present so unfortunately that is something that's very realistic uh, happens in our schools every day but when you're watching the movie you may scratch your head and go oh that's not how it would happen mm. So the timing of this film might be interesting for some people. They say, well, schools haven't been meeting in a lot of areas. We have seen a decrease, it seems, in the media coverage of school shootings. What do you make of the timing here as we start to open up schools moving forward? Uh, and it's not really on the national conscience as much when it comes to school shootings. So it hasn't been a normal learning year at all. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I'm concerned with, because we've, we've been in this, really kind of unusual place with education in the school system is a lot of our planning, our preparation may have fallen off the map. Um, schools may not have been as likely to do lockdown drills. Uh, they may not have kept up with their shelter in place. Um, and so I think we're gonna have a learning curve as we start introducing students back into the school on a regular basis. We've gotta really focus on the school safety side of it. We've seen this cycle over the last couple of decades. Um, uh, we have an incident like Parkland happen. Everybody is on board with school safety and crisis response planning and being proactive. And then over time, other factors come into play and it kind of falls off until the next big school shooting. And so one of my fears is in this kind of post COVID environment or as we try to get back to normal, we've got to focus on our planning, our practice, our response so that we don't get into this cycle of school shootings again. When it comes to the mental health aspect of school shootings, that's something we often hear in correlation to the reasoning for these things. We've seen increases recently in suicide rates for young people, skyrocketing rates of depression and other mental health related issues. What kind of role do you think that could have long term with regards to increased incidents like this? Yeah, I think long term, the mental health issue is something we've really got to look at when we talk about school shootings. It's always been an issue. And usually the issue is we identify these students that have certain needs, but because of limitations, legal limitations, those needs aren't addressed. And we're not able to bring together law enforcement, social mm -hmm. services, mental health, all of the providers that we need to treat these individuals individuals before they feel that they're in a place and the only way that anybody is going to pay attention to them or hear them is to commit an act of violence. In a post-COVID environment, I think it's even more important because as you said, uh, we're seeing rates of suicide go up. We're seeing rates of depression. And if you've already got some mental health issues and you're predisposed to 
some of these certain conditions yeah. and you're forced back into a school environment that now is maybe more structured than you've been used to in the last year, year and a half. Um, you know, I'm just afraid that, that the nexus of the mental health issues, the new school environment, the structure, um, and everything that we see going on in society may lead to a surge again in school violence. So you talked earlier about how it's important to not just study the shooter, how it's often people getting focused on the shooter and the mindset and the psyche there in the background. You want to focus on the victims as well. One of the characters, Zoe, the main character played by Isabel May, she is the survivor. She is the, the main character. What are some things that you saw in the film in her that other people in real life situations could take from? Maybe not going to the lengths that she did, but other things that they could take from to help them survive situations like and, this. And certainly we're not encouraging anyone to be proactive. Yeah. You know, the first element of the escape model is to exit. Mm -hmm. And several times Zoe has a chance to exit and she doesn't. But this is a movie, right? <laughs> and the movie is about the character. So not only did she experience a horrific uh, event that, that has kind of hardened her and, and wants to make her fight, uh, but she has that motivation from her mother throughout the movie to keep going. Yeah. And, and that's what we see in real life. It's that survivor mentality that I've got to keep going. I can be injured. I can be in pain. Uh, I, can, I can really, really be in distress and anybody else would give up, but I'm not gonna give up. Your mindset has to be, I'm going home tonight. Yeah. So one of the parts of the film that was kind of the climactic moment that for me personally gave me chills was seeing uh, Zoe talking to the shooter saying, they're not gonna remember you in the situation, they're gonna remember me. At the Daily Wire from an editorial standpoint, we don't publish the name of mass shooters. We don't wanna give them any more attention. From a law enforcement perspective, is that an effective way to at least take away some of the motivation for shooters? And what is your stance on kind of how we view the shooters versus the victims? So there's a precipitating factor that occurs mm -hmm. and that triggers the offender to start this planning process. The precipitating event might be a teacher that gives a bad grade, a principal that disciplines somebody. And it's just the totality of years and years of what the offender feels that they've been abused or they've been victimized. One of the other dynamics of the shooter is their need for power and control. Many of them feel that they've lost that ones that have been bullied, right? And it's a retaliatory strike against the school or certain individuals. But what we see Zoe do in that scene is take power from the offender. Remember I said the offenders want power, they want control? What did Zoe do in that scene? They're gonna remember me. Mm. They're gonna remember me, the good guy, the person that saved lives, that got kids out of the school. They're not gonna remember you. She took that power away from the offender. Well, John, thank you so much for your time and talking with us, offering your expertise on the matter. We really appreciate it. All right, thank you. And if you want to watch the film Run, Hide, Fight, head over to dailywire.com. I'm Cabot Phillips. Thanks so much for watching.